Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Um, if you're a note taker, Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to start. We're going to be at the end of the chapter today. If you are not a note taker, today is the day to become a note taker. Um, you just, you're, you're going to want to write at least the references down because later on, your brain is going to throw up some of these questions. I don't mean vomit throw up. I just meant, you know, it's going to bring up some of these questions and you're going to want references for that. You're going to want to be able to go back and look at this stuff yourself. So please, um, Acts 4.32, um, I've talked about before, the chapter breaks and the verse breaks in scripture are not inspired. So God inspired his word, but the chapter breaks were added later on to help us, but sometimes they get it wrong. I believe this one is wrong. So I'm gonna read the end of chapter four because I believe it introduces what we're about to read today. So verse 32, all the believers, and let's talk about the early church, they were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own. Isn't that amazing? So they shared everything that they had. And the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. And there was no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Now, this is just amazing. This is a picture of heaven on earth. This is like the Garden of Eden all over again. This is the Old Testament temple. Come to earth, come to people. Right? This is, this is us doing heaven early as the early church is what this picture is supposed to convey to us. The Holy Spirit has come. God has come near. Miracles are happening. Healing from two weeks ago. Last week, Pastor Tanner talked about the room was shaking when they prayed for boldness. God is just that near. And God's love is so strong that they are so unified and they don't even look at the things they own as if they own them. That's just, doesn't even sound real, does it? Yep. And they're able to give away to anybody who's in need. And, and I think it's so interesting too. They're able to like, they're able to take their possessions and they lay them at the apostles' feet, which is tough. Because you're like, well, I like to control where my donations go. I like to control how they've been used. I, 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 I'm kind of cynical about people. No, they just laid them at the apostles' feet and trusted them. Trusted their church leaders. That's crazy. Verse 36. Uh, for instance, there was Joseph. So this is an example they're going to give us. Luke is going to give us. The one, uh, there was Joseph, the one of the apostles that the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned, and he bought, brought the money to the apostles' feet again. Um, so Barnabas is a character that's being introduced by Dr. Luke here. Barnabas is going to come up later in the book of Acts. If you're tracking with us through this whole book, you're going to want to remember Barnabas. He's going to be a big deal uh, later on. But he starts this way. Not everybody in the early church sold all their stuff. They made it available to God. But he, Barnabas, actually sold it and gave it away. So this is a big moment. It's a special moment. Then chapter 5, verse 1. Starts with the word, but. That's not good. But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife sold some property and he brought part of the money to the apostles claiming it was the full amount with his wife's consent and he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money to yourself. Let's pause right there. Um, First off, you have a choice whether or not to let God be in control of your life. And you have a choice of even what to do with your stuff. Like Peter comes here and says, you didn't have to sell your property, dude. You didn't have to give all your money to the church. You didn't have to. God had actually not even required that of you. You had decided to do it. There are some things in our generosity and our love that are up to us, yes? Yes. And he says, but Satan has filled your heart. This, that concept of filled your heart is an important one throughout the book of Acts. Often the believers are said to be filled with God or filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with God is to be controlled by God. Amen. It's for your agenda to be laid down and for you to say, I'm totally surrendered and I want your agenda, agenda to be done in me. Yeah. And so he had surrendered his, his heart to Satan. 
And this is not like Hollywood, right? This is not like Satan comes in and like, you know, takes over. It's like, no, he yielded to the influence of the enemy. Verse four, the property was yours to sell or not sell as you wish. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Wow. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Yes. That part makes sense to us, right? Yes. Yeah. So the sin is not possessiveness. Peter is clear. The sin is not about greed, at least not greed alone. It's a weird kind of cocktail of greed and ego and lying and self-righteousness. This guy Barnabas had come along and he had sold a field and everybody's patting him on the back thinking he's the coolest Christian ever. I want to look as cool as he did, but I don't want to go through with it all. Also, I want you to know, Peter did not kill him. It sounds like a weird thing to say, but just read your Bible carefully Sometimes the things that we misunderstand is because we're reading it a little bit too fast and not paying attention to the detail. Notice that he fell to the floor and died. Did he have a heart attack? Um, was he so filled with the truth of what he had done that he just reacted? It's possible. Did God kill him in that moment? It's possible. It's not said, but it's not said that Peter issued a kill command over him. So please don't put that there. Verse six, then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. Verse nine, Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Ooh. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Great fear, of yes. course. Great fear. Great fear in the church. Great fear even outside the church. Like Peter had been preaching and thousands would come to Jesus and get baptized. Now they're a bit afraid, wouldn't you be? And they are. And what's weird is if you continue to read the passage it says that multitudes and groups keep coming to Jesus and they keep coming into the church, but people are very, very careful. Of course they would be. I got to wonder, did Luke want to even include this little chapter in his book? Was he tempted as he went to write this down? God, maybe I will just skip this one. I would have been tempted, but the Holy Spirit would not let him. The Holy Spirit, just please understand this. The Holy Spirit determined that this episode of early church history needed to be preserved for us. That's right. And so I'm not going to leapfrog it with you today. I'm going to tell you about it. Yeah, I got this quiet first service too. <laughs> so let's start with grace for a second. Um, we are Grace Fellowship Church. We are Grace Preaching Church. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. Yes, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not by any of your works so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8. Uh, we did nothing to earn our way back to God, yes? Yes. We can't earn our way by cleaning ourselves up. We can't earn our way by doing enough wonderful righteousness kind of stuff in order to get God's attention. We can't. We, he's got to save us by his grace. And Jesus earned that for us on the cross. Everything that you've ever done in your past, in your present, in your future was paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross, becomes a gift that is available to you. You either take it or you don't. Amen. And if you take his gift and if you surrender to Jesus and say, you're my Lord and Savior, then you become a new creation, the scripture says. The old is gone and the new is come. And that is all by grace. And then you're going to sin again tomorrow. And it's still going to be grace. And the day after that and the day after that, it's all going to be grace. No matter what you do, it's going to be 
grace. Then how in the world do we get this chapter in our Bible? Right? I think, I think sometimes, and we've been, we've been really wrestling with this as a church, if you've been with us for the last four or five months, we've been wrestling with this idea that even though God has given us his grace and we've got his patience with all the stuff that we do, and we've got his mercy with all the stuff that we do, even though that's true, God still expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. God still expects us to know his commands and to know his wisdom and to know his will and to care about it because it matters. And sometimes we get so much into our enjoyment of grace and our gratitude, which by the way, I believe is the engine of sanctification for you theologians in the room. But even though it is, it is dangerous to forget the will of God. It does matter. And sometimes in our enjoyment of grace, we start to forget that it matters. And they got quite the reminder that it matters. Whoa. Moments like this remind the church. Now be careful how you read this passage without meaning to. If you're not careful, you will, you will put tone into Peter's words when he says the words that he says. You'll put motive into him. You'll, you'll, you'll make conclusions about his heart when he was there saying the things he was doing and doing the things he was doing. But you don't know. Be careful. Be careful. Um, there's a poem. Uh, Pastor John Piper wrote this about this passage. And I just thought it was insightful. Um, I don't agree with everything that other pastors say but I learn a lot from the perspectives of other pastors and God speaks through them sometimes. I am challenged and and learn from their reading of scripture sometimes. Sometimes I just just learn where the the really deep parts are in a passage where I need to study more deeply. Um, But Piper wrote this poem and and the, the poem is from the perspective of Peter and he imagines Peter on this night Uh, sitting next to the graves of Ananias and Sapphira and weeping. And Peter's weeping because what has struck Peter more than anything is why in the world did you do this, Lord, when I denied you three times? And here's part of this poem. It says, end with a curse said one more time. I do not know this man, the crime that Peter committed in those lies now rose before his very eyes. A thousand times more heinous than Sapphira's lies or of the man who put her to it. Peter sat there trembling, weak and stunned now at the difference. Lord, why? He cried. My sin is worse. Three times I lied. While you were suffering for me, I did not know why this should be, that they should die and I should live or how you wrath and mercy give. He lifted Peter up his hands and said, oh Lord, why did I not drop dead? Now that's Piper's guess, but just, just let it balance you as you read this. Like I said, I've, I've, I've done a lot of studies, scholars and commentaries and things like that on this passage. I will say I saw a lot of really bad teaching in some of those. Um, that's not common. I don't, I don't see a lot of bad teaching commonly. This passage, because it deals with such a serious topic, it really gets us stirred up. And sometimes we want to wiggle out of the truth or we want to overdefine things that aren't defined there. Be careful about that. Don't overinterpret stuff and say, I know exactly what this is. There were people who were, who were trying to say, I know Ananias and Sapphira's, Sapphira weren't Christians because God would have never done that. What are we saying? And the indication from the passage is that they were believers. Or I know exactly what the sin was because it's such a heinous sin. I don't think that's the thrust of the passage. I think the thrust of the passage is not how heinous their sin was. Just like the poem said, Peter's sin was worse. I think what's going on here is that holiness had come near. Why did this happen? Holiness had come near. And when holiness comes near, true holiness comes near, it gets really dangerous for sinful people. 
When real holiness comes near, it gets really dangerous for sinful people. That's what we see in the scripture. You remember Uzzah who touched the ark? Touched the ark of the covenant? And died. In Numbers uh, chapter 4, God had given instructions about the ark of the covenant. I mean, with the mercy seat on top and the, 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 the testimony inside and the very presence of God was in the ark. And God had said, no one can touch it. And it's got to be carried with these special poles and only the Levites can be involved and never on a cart. And David's bringing the ark, you know, into Zion and, and some people get kind of loosey goosey with the rules. And all of a sudden this guy reaches out to touch the ark and dies. And it's funny, you read the passage and David even gets mad at God. But he misunderstood that when holiness comes near, it's dangerous for sinful people. God's word cannot be ignored. Amen. And I'm not being here fire and brimstone with you guys today. I'm not changing tone. That's not the point of this. The point is that we hold grace and the holiness of God together. Yeah. It's, it's all together. It's all in him together because Yuza touched the ark and died. And there was a dangerous holiness there. But if you think about it, there was a dangerous holiness in the Garden of Eden too. In Mount Sinai, when Moses is getting the 10 commandments and the fire is going, God's like, don't even let them approach the mountain or touch the mountain or they'll die because the holiness of God had come near. The holy of holies with the curtain in front of it, you cannot come in. Only the high priest could come in once a year. And even when he did, they tied a rope around his ankle just in case something went down in there. I mean, that's rough because you didn't mess around with the holiness of God when the holiness of God came near. And the early church, the Holy Spirit had come near. God had come near. And Ananias did not discern the moment that he was in. We celebrate the miracles. We celebrate the goodness and the preaching and the church growth. We celebrate the sharing and the unity. We celebrate all of that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, did we forget the holiness of God was here? People say that they want revival. And they think that means singing kumbaya around a campfire with a lot of warm feelings. Historically, revival is when the spirit of God comes and convicts the world of sin. Amen. Come on. And if you look at it historically, when revival actually happened, confession of sin went through the roof and repentance from sin went through the roof because when holiness comes near, God deals with sin. See, we, we want the holiness of God. We just don't want it right now <laughs> and right here. But we want it. We want the purity. We want the justice of God. Think about it for a second. Like we want the purity of God's rule. We want systems of government to be set right. Now, I just said that out loud in a political year. We want the systems of government to be set right. That's right. Yes? We want every predator to be dealt with. We want every tyrant to be brought low. We want every lie to be burned away. We want every cruelty, every greed, every weakness to be cast out by God like sunrise casts out the dark. Amen. That's what we want. We want that someday. But we forget what the sudden sunrise would do to us today. It'd be a tough day. When God comes near, holiness comes near. Now that wasn't deep enough, so let's go deeper. Just a little bit. 1 Corinthians 11.30. Yeah, Christians are sometimes taken home. <clears throat> Verse 30, you're like, is this in my Bible? Yes, it is. I thought this was just Old Testament. No, it's not. Christians are sometimes taken home. Um, oh, let me give you some context for this, because this, it's a massive passage. It's been misinterpreted a ton. So the early Christians were having what they called these love feasts or Jesus feasts. And they were like uh, large meals that they were having together. Think, think Baptist potlucks like I grew up with, you know, and, and everybody's having a great time. And in the midst of it, they would have the Lord's Supper. They would celebrate communion together. But Paul noticed that while they were doing that, uh, people's greed took over and they were trying to get first in line you know, to get the best apple pie before anybody else could get it. 
I'm trying to be funny because this is such a serious topic. But it's like, but there was greed that was taking over and, and the poor were being shoved down and the wealthier people were, giving, uh, were getting in line before them. And there was all kinds of things that were happening that were bad. And Paul was looking at this whole practice that was going on in the early church. And he's like, how can you do that when you're also celebrating the Lord's Supper, which is all about the kindness and grace and generosity of Jesus and the fact that he doesn't put any one person in front of another? It doesn't make any sense. And so then he says this, that is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Amen. That's as deep as it gets, folks. And that's scary. Wait a second. You're saying that sometimes people have just gone home to heaven because of what they were doing in the church, that's what he just said. I'll give you a second. Try to unpack this. Um, I thought we aren't condemned in Christ. Correct. We are not condemned in Christ. As far as God's justice as far as him declaring us guilty or not guilty, if you are under Christ and he has died for you and you've surrendered to him, you are not condemned. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. But when you became a new creation and the spirit of Christ came into you, now this is deep theological stuff. You okay? When the spirit of Jesus Christ came into you, part of what came into you was the spirit of compassion. And when that spirit of compassion came into you, then one of the things that starts to happen to a new believer is if they hurt somebody else, they feel it. If they hurt somebody else and they're selfish with somebody else, all of a sudden there's a conviction that comes into them. They know it was wrong. And they grieve what they've done. Why? Because the spirit of Jesus Christ himself is inside of you now. So you're going to feel that, a version of a condemnation or a guilt or a judgment. Yes, it's going to be inside of you. And when I arrive home in heaven and I see Jesus face to face, I want the amount of things that I've done to hurt people to be a small stack of things. Yes? I don't want there to be a lot there. And so in this passage, he's like, hey, listen, sometimes if you're kind of losing your mind and you're in a spot in your life where bitterness and darkness is so taken over that you're just not the same person that you used to be and you're hurting people on the regular, God may take you home. And he may take you home and that's not only a grace to them, but it's a grace to you. Yes. Because when I get to glory and he shows me what it is that I've been doing, and he shows me what he's just saved me from. Yes, I will say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You're like, well, I don't want that to be my last chapter on earth. I know, me either. Me either. Let that motivate you. That's the deep end. I believe that in the moment that I enter glory, my ego and selfishness will finally be gone. Yeah. Yep. I will see Jesus. And even in the place where I've struggled to love others more than myself, I finally will. And I will thank him for bringing me home. And I believe, now here's a big statement. I believe Ananias thanked him. And Sapphira too. Thank you, Lord. We were bringing harm to your people with our hypocrisy. We were about to set a tone in the early church when it was most vulnerable. And it's the last thing in the world we wanted to do. We were caught in our blindness. We were caught in ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for not letting it go any further. And that is deep, deep stuff, folks. Philippians chapter one, verse 22. If we're still alive, it's for the good of others. 
But if I live, Paul says, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. Say far better. To be in the presence of Christ. It's the ultimate, guys. See, God sees this whole thing through eyes of eternity. And it's like, it would be so much better to be in his presence right now. All the things I struggle with today, gone. He says, verse 24, but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Now, why did Paul say that? He's like, because I've still got ministry to help people. And if I've still got ministry to help people and God knows that, then he's gonna keep me breathing. So here's the other side of this. And this is maybe what you might consider the more positive side of this. Because if we are still breathing, it means God's got a plan. It means God's got a purpose. God's got something he's trying to do in me. Um, We, uh, this was maybe a year or two ago, I stretched this big rope across this whole stage and I asked two soldiers to hold up both ends and to keep it really taut. And I really underestimated the amount of strength it was gonna take for them to do that and to make it taut and to keep it taut. And then I preached really long while they were standing there sweating. It was, it was a great day. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the rope was supposed to represent eternity. And then we came and we put a little scratch right here and just said, the scratch is your life. It's the tiny little amount of time that you've got on planet earth. <clears throat> and what's weird is this world does everything to brainwash us with the idea that all that exists in us, our entire legacy is completely on the scratch. And that the rest of that eternity doesn't matter or doesn't exist or take your pick. And they're wrong and God is right. And because we believe that lie, so much of what God does and says doesn't make sense to us because he believes in eternity because he's in eternity, because he purchased eternity for you and he's bringing you to it and he knows what it's about. And because he knows what it's about, he knows what a tiny little scratch this thing is. So yeah, if he's gonna save us from hurting other people and hurting ourselves, he might take us home a little early. And I think when he shows us what's what, I think we'll thank him. And we'll be glad. And then like Paul, I can pray, oh God, while I'm still breathing here, would you give me the ability to bless other people? Because I want my time in here to be worth that. Now some disclaimers. Now, even though Paul said this, and even though the whole thing happened with Ananias and Sapphira, I'm not trying to oversimplify God's choosing of, of your going home and how that happens and when that happens. I'm not trying to oversimplify that. I'm not trying to say that, well, you better do a good job or this because there's great mystery in what God chooses for the end of your life. And I would never try to overinterpret that for you. So be careful. And I know there's so much all across this room coming up into your minds now. What about this situation? What about this family situation? What about this tragedy that happened over here? And I get it. And I'm not trying to explain all that away to you. I'm trying to help you understand God's perspective so you can trust him. And I'll admit to you that some of us trusting God with crisis and with death is an easier time than others of us. Some of you, what you've seen and the people that you have loved and the things that you have gone through, it feels like a mountain of trust to you. Can I just respect and honor you for a second? Only Jesus can work the miracle of trust and faith in your heart. But you are called to walk in faith with him. You're called to believe him, to believe him about resurrection. But I'm not trying to draw conclusions about people who, who may suddenly go home to heaven Jesus died at 33 years old and it was not because he lacked purpose in this world. It was because God determined that a death at 33 years old was the greatest way to impact the world. So many different situations that are out there. I want to humbly accept that mystery. 
Psalm 116, 15 says, my death is precious to God. The Lord cares deeply, verse 15, when his loved ones die. To me, that's the most important verse in this entire message. The Lord cares deeply. Some of your versions say, the death of the saints is precious in the eyes of the Lord. Right, like, like, the, the, the day we pass, the, the way, the, the circumstances, it is precious in the mind of God, right? It is, it is not an afterthought. You are not an afterthought. No day of your life is an afterthought to God. You can trust him because he cares. He cares about you as much in the good times as he does in your darkest times. You can trust him. That's what that verse says. God decided exactly when I'll die. You have decided, verse five, the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live and we are not given a minute longer. Job 14, five. It's a call to trust. And again, I'll, I'll admit, for some of you, stories have opened up in your heart and you're like, but there was this tragedy over here and it was terrible and the way that this went down was terrible. Does that explain all of that? And are you saying that God determined that that way? I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying any of that. That'd be a whole message all by itself to try to dive into all of that stuff. What I'm trying to say is God, you can trust him. You can trust the Lord. And trust him and stop trusting yourself. It's great to know that we are not victims of chance and that our lives are not out of control. That's the testimony of scripture. It's also important for us to know that we've got to stop trusting everything else we put our trust in. Because your keto diets are great. Your exercise regimens, your 401ks, it's, it's, it's all great. There's value there. I'm not saying that there's not value there. But you cannot add a day to your life. They're also in their way, nothing, because you are not in control. He alone chooses my going home. Second Corinthians 5, 6, if we die, we are home with Jesus. And this is the really good news. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not home with the Lord, for we live by believing and not by seeing. There's faith. We've got to believe. Yes, we are fully confident we would rather be away from these earth, earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. What, what he affirms there, and this is huge, he says, if you're away from your body, you are home with Jesus. Amen. And that's, that's huge. Remember, Jesus is on the cross with, the, with the, uh, the criminal next to him and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. I love that timing in his language, Yes. I don't want to wait around and be alone for a millennia before Jesus finally gets around to me. No, no, no. Today you will be with me in paradise. That matters. Um, the way Tolkien said this is, he said, the gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass and then you see it, white shores and beyond a far green country under a swift sunrise. What's waiting for us in the face of Jesus and the, the eyes of Jesus that have loved me my whole life staring back at me for the very first time. Hallelujah. The peace that my sin cannot hurt anyone anymore. The realization that all my habits, I'm finally free and not bound up anymore. The thankfulness that he kept every promise he ever made to me and brought me safely to himself. Can you imagine that? See, God's got an eternal perspective. I want to end with the going home of Moses. This might seem like a little bit of a right turn to you, but um, it was precious to me as I was studying this this week. <clears throat> this is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 48. It says, that same day the Lord said to Moses, go to Moab to the mountains east of the river and climb Mount Nebo. Then you will die there, Moses, on the mountain. For both of you, and he means him and his brother Aaron, both of you betrayed me with the Israelites in the waters of, at the waters of Meribah and at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. You failed to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel there. So just pause you just really quick. Um, if you've never read this before, here's the picture. Moses has done so much so faithfully in leading God's people 
amazing man of God. And there's this moment and they're dying of thirst in the wilderness and he gets kind of ticked off at the people, which is a pastor I understand, by the way. And sometimes your temper. And he's there and there's this rock and God had told him, speak to the rock and all of a sudden water is gonna flow out and all the people are gonna be able to drink. And Moses, in that emotion, instead of speaking to the rock, he grabs his staff and he smacks the rock. And he says, do I have to bring this water out for you? And so he doesn't, he doesn't do it God's way and he doesn't do it with God's heart. And in the moment he takes credit for a miracle of Yahweh. Yeah. And it's like God comes into the moment is like, man, you've led faithfully and I love you and this has been great, but I cannot put my rubber stamp of approval on your leadership right now. Because if I do, what will this do to my people? And it's gonna plant this seed in them and you have no idea where this is gonna go. I can't look the other way on this. And so I want you to see his love for Moses here. In verse, or chapter 34, verse one, it says, then Moses went up to Mount Nebo and the Lord showed him the whole land. And the Lord said to Moses, this is the land that I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not enter the land. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said, and the Lord buried him in a valley. And guys, don't just read scripture. You gotta read scripture. Sometimes you gotta slow down and you gotta take in the detail because it's there. It's there for you. There's just so much treasure. But it's like this whole, like all the wandering in the wilderness to get to the promised land and they're right there. And God says, instead of just an Ananias moment for you, Moses, I'm gonna take you up to this mountain and I'm gonna show you where they're about to go. Because the battle is won. And I want you to know that I'm fulfilling all the promises that I made to Abraham. And God sits there and shows him the land. It's like his very own tour guide in God form. It's crazy. And God shows it to him. See the tenderness of that? If you read the passage before it, God, God says, I'm gonna let you install Joshua as the new leader of my people. And then Moses gets to give this, this blessing and this confirmation over God's people and this prayer over God's people. And then it says that God laid him down and took his spirit home. And then God himself buried his body in a valley that no one else could find. God himself, the father did that. And you're like, well, the last chapter of his life, he didn't do it right, true. But the father didn't stop loving him, did he? He didn't lose his status with God, did he? And then what will really blow your mind is if you look in the book of Matthew, when Jesus goes on the Mount of Transfiguration and two people from the Old Testament arrive to have a very pers personal and honoring conversation with Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and Moses is one of them. Poor! You, you gotta trust him, Okay. You gotta trust him with your kids. You gotta trust him with your marriage. You gotta trust him with your money and your future and your career. You gotta trust him with everything. You gotta trust him with the day of your going home. You gotta trust him. Amen. You're like, but I don't understand all the answers. I know, I know. Let go of your grip on this world. Believe in resurrection because he told you it's true. This is the faith, amen? amen. Why don't you guys stand? Let's trust him. Jesus, I love that as big as you are, God, you're so individual with us and you see us and you see our life and you see our heart, God. And, and Lord, you're guiding us and you're loving us, God, and protecting us. And we are in your hand. Our days are in your hand. Our final day on this earth is in your hand. God, I pray that we would trust you. I pray that we would trust you, Lord. And God, even as I ask that, 
I know that's a taller order for some of us than it is for others. And I know that it's a miracle that you have to do inside of us. So Jesus, would you come and do that miracle right now? Give us faith. In Christ's name, amen.